Today, let's talk about the legendary figure in the 20th century psychology, Sigmund Freud, and the school of thought he founded, psychoanalysis. No matter how much you know about psychology, you've probably heard Freud's name, accompanied by significant controversy. Some consider him a pioneering genius, while others label him the father of pseudoscience. Nevertheless, the influence of psychoanalysis has extended far beyond therapy and even the field of psychology itself, leaving its mark on the intellectual history of the entire 20th century. To be honest, the scientific psychology community today doesn't entirely endorse Freud and psychoanalytic theory. Even within the school of psychoanalysis, many of Freud's ideas have been revised or overturned by his successors, leading to a complex and evolving landscape. For me, Freud's significance is multifaceted. I am thankful for his role in pioneering talk therapy, which is seen as the foundation of the counseling profession. Without him, many of us might not have our careers today. However, just because Freud provided me with a career, I don't believe everyone should study his theories. In my view, Freud's greatest value lies in offering an entirely new way of self-understanding for every ordinary person. In this lesson, I'll help you understand the core ideas of psychoanalysis from three perspectives. The unconscious, psychoanalysis introduced a new psychological concept called the unconscious. Before, in the early days of psychology, the two dominant schools of thought were structuralism and functionalism. They both shared the idea that the only way to understand someone's inner thoughts was to have them express it themselves. But what if, sometimes, people cannot express or even understand their own inner processes? Freud proposed a different approach. He claimed that there are many mental activities that individuals are unaware of. He compared the structure of the human mind to an iceberg, where the conscious mind represents the tip of the iceberg above the water, and the vast majority of the mind, the unconscious, remains hidden beneath the surface. This concept of the unconscious was a radical shift in psychology. It focused on a hidden self, one that is beyond what you consciously know. Freud, a psychoanalyst and a medical doctor, initially observed this distinction in his patients. For example, one of his colleagues, Dr. Joseph Brewer, treated a patient known as Anna O., oh, who is considered the first psychoanalytic patient in history. During one of her treatments, Anna O. Oh experienced symptoms like limb spasms and abdominal contractions, seemingly related to childbirth, while yelling, Dr. Brewer's child is being born. There was no physical relationship between Anna and Dr. Brewer, and if asked in a conscious state if she wanted to have a child with him, she would deny it. Freud believed that these symptoms expressed unconscious conflicts. These conflicts were not visible during a person's conscious moments but might manifest in slips of the tongue, absent-mindedness, or even in dreams. This inability to understand some of our own mental processes presented a significant challenge to psychology. Freud's answer was that people have many mental activities that they are unaware of. These unconscious processes play a substantial role in our lives, even though they remain hidden from our conscious awareness. The idea of unconscious mental processes wasn't new, and some thinkers had suggested similar concepts as far back as the 17th century. William James, whom I discussed in the previous lesson, also described some mental processes as operating outside our conscious control, which is reminiscent of the concept of the unconscious. So, what made psychoanalysis so valuable? The key isn't just the unconscious itself but what resides within it. The acceptance of the dark side of human nature is the second perspective. Many people harbor aspects of themselves they'd rather not acknowledge, and psychoanalysis helps in embracing these darker elements of human nature. A friend of mine, who is a psychoanalyst, was initially drawn to psychology by attending a psychoanalytic lecture. She had recently given birth and was feeling emotionally unsettled. Her teacher asked the students to share their dreams in what is known as dream analysis, as Freud believed that dreams were a pathway to understanding the unconscious. My friend shared a distressing dream about losing her child. The teacher casually remarked, Oh, you unconsciously hate your child. She was horrified and said, No, no, I could never hate my child. I love them. The teacher responded, Of course, you love your child consciously, but there's also hatred buried in your unconscious. This revelation had a profound impact on my friend. She spent that night crying while holding her child, feeling that her complex emotions were validated. 
After giving birth, she had experienced bodily changes, put her career on hold, and felt a sense of regret at times, but she never allowed herself to acknowledge these feelings. She felt it was wrong to have complaints as a mother. However, now she realized that these were part of human nature and could be held in the unconscious mind, which provided her immense solace and led her to dedicate her life to psychoanalysis. I believe that one of the most significant contributions of psychoanalysis to ordinary people is the liberation from ethical constraints and the acceptance of suppressed emotions. Freud introduced the idea of the three-part structure of personality, the ID, the ego, and the superego. The ID represents the most primitive part of ourselves, seeking immediate satisfaction of desires. The ego is based on considering reality, adhering to social rules, and selectively fulfilling these desires. The superego is the strictest, serving as a moral authority. Among these concepts, the ID is arguably the most liberating. In addition to basic survival instincts, the ID includes sexual desires and aggressive instincts. In the conservative society of Freud's time, this idea was shocking. Numerous scholars criticized him, arguing that humans are the highest beings and shouldn't possess such base desires. However, these ideas spread like wildfire and became a part of almost every generation's thinking in the 20th century, even influencing today's Western mainstream culture. Perhaps even Freud himself didn't anticipate this level of influence. I believe that these ideas gain traction because the more repressive the environment, governed by the moralizing superego, the more valuable the theory of embracing capriciousness and confronting darkness becomes. You might not agree with many of psychoanalysis's assumptions, but today, most people can openly admit that human beings are complex, containing both light and dark elements in their nature. This is psychoanalysis's most significant contribution. It allows us to recognize that love can coexist with hate, nobility with selfishness, and normal human nature encompasses its dark counterparts without feeling guilty or ashamed. So, how does psychoanalysis help with change? Some argue that if psychoanalysis merely identifies an invisible unconscious and describes it as dark, can it genuinely help people improve? Could it inadvertently encourage indulgence, moral decay, or even destruction? This brings us to the third perspective, psychoanalysis offers a new approach to making changes. As I mentioned earlier, Freud's profession was that of a medical doctor, and he developed a talk-based therapeutic method, psychoanalytic therapy. This method has evolved into a highly complex academic discipline today. While I won't go into the specifics of how it works, I'll introduce a core concept related to change called defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are used to block change, but they are not necessarily bad. According to Freud, they are the pillars that maintain the stability of our inner world. Despite the multitude of unconscious dark desires we discussed earlier, defense mechanisms play a crucial role in preventing them from causing destructive consequences. People use various defenses to keep these desires at bay. Some may completely forget things they dislike, others may detach themselves emotionally, appearing robotic, and yet others might express their anger by constantly criticizing things they find disagreeable. These people might have similar impulses in their unconscious minds, and their defenses are their ways of managing those impulses. Since defenses are essential for maintaining mental stability, promoting change doesn't mean advocating for people to drop their defenses entirely. Instead, it involves understanding a person's defense mechanisms and recognizing their functions. Once you understand these mechanisms, you can introduce healthier ways of managing these impulses. And how is this change achieved? Through conversation. Freud treated numerous patients with various disorders, and many of them had symptoms like hysteria. These symptoms, he believed, were a result of suppressed desires that would suddenly manifest as physical ailments, akin to a defense mechanism. But Freud discovered that when patients verbalized these unconscious conflicts and brought them to conscious awareness, their symptoms often disappeared. This process, known as making the unconscious conscious, is a fundamental insight in psychoanalysis. Today, many psychologists and therapists don't use Freud's theories, but we all agree that when someone resists change, they are not wrong. Instead, we aim to understand the person better through conversation and reveal their inner conflicts. It is only then that change can occur. This idea has become a common consensus in the field of counseling. In summary, 
While the specific ideas of psychoanalytic therapy are no longer the norm in modern psychology, psychoanalysis offers every ordinary person a new way to understand themselves. Here's a thought-provoking question for you, which problems in life do you think are particularly well-suited for explanation using psychoanalytic methods, and which are not? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. In the next lesson, I'll introduce you to a psychological school of thought that is in direct contrast to psychoanalysis, behaviorism.